Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to GameStar TV for the GameStar Summer Qualifiers for your Heroes of the Storm action on this Tuesday night. My name is Kit Fox. I will be your host for this evening. And once again, it is my pleasure to introduce the GameStar production team as producer, the wizard behind the curtain pushing the buttons is Crisis. And uh, you won't be able to hear him, but we will. But this man is, uh, well, he'll be your play-by-play -play caster tonight. It's Skimmy. How are you, mate? Oh, mate, I'm having an absolute gem of a day. And your analyst for this evening will be none other than Vandy. Oh, hi. <laughs> Good to see you guys. No, oh, get excited. I hope you're as pumped as I am. We've got nine teams that have showed up here for this Tuesday night. I am so excited. And every Tuesday night, same as last week, right here on GameStar TV One, brought to you by our sponsor, Zowie, Strive for Perfection, Blizzard ANZ, Split Media Labs, whose products we use to power our broadcasts, such as XSplit, Challenge, and of course, Player.me, the coolest social media platform for gamers, and accumulating points in this tournament each week within the GSQ. The top two teams at the end of the series will qualify for the HGC. That is the official blizzard event and if you qualify for that this is the prizes that you have a shot at at if you qualify if you come fourth so that's just you just have to qualify you would get yourself two thousand dollars if you place third you get 4k second place is 6k and if you win the overall event you net yourself a good eight thousand dollars and that's not bad for playing video games. Hey, mum, and tell her to leave you alone for the next couple of hours because you are working. You are grinding for that cash. It is week two of the Swiss format. Teams are given a chance to play each other and gain experience against everyone. That's why we love Swiss format. There are three new teams that have shown up for this week. There was a couple dropouts from last week as well, and it makes for an interesting competition indeed. The different five maps from last week have been swapped out, and that is from the official HGC map pool. This week it'll be Warhead Junction, Battlefield of Eternity, Dragonshire, Braxis Holdout, and Infernal Shrines. You can look at the official map pool for yourself at www.gamestar.com. Just a quick PSA, Artanis is banned due to a bug, same as last week. Any team playing Artanis will instantly forfeit their match all other champions are fair game, even Zul'jin. And, of course, it would not be a GameStar cast without viewer giveaways in Twitch. GameStar will be giving away a little Ragnaros bundle at 50 viewers, and at 100 viewers we'll be giving away a Zul'jin bundle. Thanks to Blizzard ANZ, so thanks to them. Get onto their Twitter, give them a like. Facebook as well for all the news in the region and the players. They've got the chance to be nominated for an MVP award that's by the analyst and play-by-play -play caster at the end of each match, and they have a chance to go into the draw to win themselves a headset, thanks to Plantronics, the official headset sponsor of GameStar. Now, Abdul, give me another crunch real quick because it is time for some Heroes of the Storm action, so I'm going to hand you over to a man whose voice has once been described to me as warm chocolate fudge drizzling over a layer of ice cream. It is skinny. Well, it might sound a little bit more like I'm in a, yeah, a bathtub right now, so excuse me if your fantasy of a chocolate fudge has been ruined. But uh, yeah, here we go for another week, guys. How are you feeling, Vandy? I'm feeling good. I mean, it's week two. This is where all the nerves have sort of been shaken off. Everyone knows what the competition's like. You've had a crack at it. We've got some newcomers who are sort of ready to dive right into it. So I am keen, keen tonight. Excuse me. Keen has been, and like as you said, we've got a brand new roster of maps to go through. Warhead Junction's never actually ever been played. I've seen the stats on uh, MasterLeague.net, a very handy site for actually comparing uh, first picks, most uh, played compositions, and even maps. I'm looking here, and in the HGC and all relevant tournaments recently, Warhead Junction's been picked once. I mean, <laughs> with a pick rate like that, is it just due to you think the map is too new to sort of be rusted in? Or do you just think it's just because there's not a lot of strategy going on, Skimmy? Or do you just think no one likes it? Like, why is that? I think it really boils down to that last last point. I just don't think anybody likes the map. I mean, when I've played it in quick match, it kind of feels to me like, please, like, it's just one of those maps where I don't enjoy it. And uh, when it comes down to sort of statistics like that, then uh, it seems likely that nobody's wanting to play. Now, we're going to get ourselves organized in this lobby. It looks like uh, the players have got themselves in their own lobby. So I'll let you take the reins for two seconds whilst we uh, get you some coverage. No worries indeed. And actually, just touching on that, I mean, actually, I feel the same way about that one too. So it's definitely not my favorite. 
it's definitely not one that I look forward to, but I really want to see, I guess, what the competitive scene can do with it and just sort of what sort of strats we might see sort of emerging tonight. Well, I think it's it's a map where there is no definitive uh, strategy that's been deployed at this stage. It's it's all up in the air. The only composition I'm looking at here that's um, been successful, they had Muradin, Frawl, Sylvanas, Li Ming, and Brightwing. Biggest bands were on Zeratol as well as ETC, and that makes sense. I mean, ETC right now is he's the most played hero. He's undisputedly the best tank, and, well, Zeratol... Uh, very strong pairing as well. The Void Prism, we saw a lot of that VP uh, Ring of Frost combo come out last week. I'm sure we're going to see the same once more. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's strong for a reason, and that's because it works. And ETC is just so much popularity because he just, I guess, he does everything well. And he's just a very, very strong character in getting things done and sort of initiating for his team. You need a playmaker, and ETC in the right hands can be an absolute nightmare. So definitely a no-brainer there, Skimmy. No, Brian. Indeed. What I'm going to get you to do, I'm going to get you to join this lobby because we've got all the players ready to rock and roll. We can get some uh, games to week number two underway for you guys. Here is the storm action from down under. Who have you got your bets on for this week, uh, Vandy? We've got a couple of new teams, as you already mentioned. I'm looking at some of those rosters, and a few of the names really jump out at me. Most notably, Explicit. He's a uh, ANZ favorite. <laughs> yeah, an ANZ sweetheart, some might say, and also an ANZ tyrant, as others might say. Whether or not, whatever opinion you've got on Explicit, he's been around for a while, and that's just because, realistically, he loves the game. So to see that he's got a team together, I want to see what they're going to bring. I'm looking forward to seeing some uh, Esmodon. You know, he's the kind of character that really inspires me to play Esmodon. He was the one that actually taught me how to cheese and play Cursed Hollow, and just push a lane all day. It doesn't matter how many times you're ganked. If you get that keep, if you've taken down that many faults, you are the real MVP. <laughs> you are the real MVP indeed. You deserve your own little shiny medal, a little trophy there, like you know, kids used to get skimmy. And indeed, I mean, Asmodan can just bring <laughs> out so much. And in fact, just playing a quick match with him the other day with Benja, I unfortunately had the pleasure of bumping into Benjamin. He showed me why Asmodan could be such a a daring sort of force and all the dunks that were coming out um, i'll tell you asmodan's not down and out he's just he's a bit of a niche pick if you know how to play around him obviously but oh, what about the new build that he has oh the new yeah build with the laser i mean how how different is that let's open up a brand new can of worms and if you're illidan well it's uh, pretty frustrating but let's jump into the draft fandy game number one is underway we are on the warhead junction it's the one that everybody's been waiting for we're getting it out uh, in first map succession, nobody wants to look forward to that one. They want it off the table. It's almost like that saying, you know, get all the stuff that you hate and you're going to be sort of feeling all anxious about. Get it done at the start of the morning, then you can enjoy the rest of the night. There we go. Starting off with Dahaka and Frau Bandaway. Do you reckon that's any any surprise in those two? No, not indeed. I mean, even just saying what, uh, what bands you brought up before, Dahaka, no-brainer. That global presence, too strong in a map like this, where it's quite small and just being able to tunnel up when the warheads spawn. Nah, none of that. And also securing the ETC pick for themselves right there, Skimmy. So obviously just wanting to narrow down the warrior pool for the blue team. Uh, ETC saw so much play. I was looking at statistics for the HGC in both uh, NA as well as EU. And ETC picked up a few accolades, actually. He's uh, apparently known as the most balanced hero in all 29 games that he played. Most banned map we had also was Warhead Junction. So <laughs> a lot of love on this map. People just don't seem to want to strat it, don't want to scrim it, don't want to play it. <laughs> it's just, I mean, maybe it's something to do with the nukes on the map, Skimmy. It's a bit brutal having to nuke each other to death. But <laughs> hey, it's the name of the game. It's a Warhead Junction. What reminds me um, is, did you ever see that game at the World Champs where they had a, a big fight in the top boss lane and like, they literally, instead of um, committing the boss for the objective, well, instead of going for the faults in the structure, should I say, they actually blew all their um, all their nukes on the bomb camp, uh, on the actual boss camp, and it's just a big cluster of team fight action, boss killing everybody, bombs going off here, then everywhere. As a caster, I mean, that's the dream, but also your throat's just going to be absolutely killed. <laughs> and he goes and again, again, again. No, I'm so sad I missed out on that one. I'm going to find the replay of that one right after, because that sounds exactly like my type of party. And uh, we're seeing a Tychus pick up here, as well as a Brightwing Muradin pick up. So, I mean, they're still securing a warrior, I guess, in case they want to roll with two tanks. But as well as I was going to say, they probably want to narrow down uh, the support and get it locked in nice and early so they can have first choice on that one. 
Yes, they've gone for the Brightwing, which once again gives them that global pressure. No surprises here. Brightwing definitely in that trinity of the top three supports. She's finding her niche and she's finding her um, her presence pretty well known in terms of global as well as actually team fire potential. Now that gives them a reliable interrupt with the polymorph for the ETC, really trying to uh, negate what he's going to achieve. Interesting to see how ETC goes for this one, if he is going to go for the Mosh or for the stage dive, given that global pressure. But Muradin being locked in nice and early, they want to make sure they have a solid tank pick. They want to make sure that they uh, have a front line they can be proud of. But these picks are going right down to the line. Tychus was locked in, as you mentioned, the perfect tank assassin. And Zaya rounds things out. Now, Zaya, she's found so, so much uh, attention recently in this current patch as perfect complement to this sort of double tanky meta. Mm, I mean, where Zarya just shines so brightly is the fact that she can, I guess, absorb damage and then turn it into damage of her own. And as well as that expulsion zone, just doing so much work at locking you out from objectives. And how do you win most of these heroes maps? You capture the objective. So it's she's just a strong powerhouse at the moment. She really excels, especially when paired with another sort of frontline or even just a squishy assassin where you can kind of bait out people um, to get charge on your energy. So... It's a strong, strong pick right there. And I mean, if you were the blue team right now, Skimmy, you'd be looking. They've got a very strong front line. They've got a tank shredder. You'd be asking yourself, okay, now what are we going to do to sort of negate that or best deal with it? Well, we can see once again this map being one of the biggest maps in the game. They go for another global ban. They take out the Falstead here. And I think we haven't seen a lot of Falstead quite recently. He used to be the go-to hero. Uh, Gus was just such high priority. But especially last week, we only saw him in a couple of games. So he's showing has uh, definitely depleted, but Alarak is now being banned away as well. He's found a lot of presence in that sort of melee role. He can, uh, you know, take you back, silence you, do that annoying combo. And I've seen it paired time and time again with other um, synergistic heroes, say like the Tarande, uh, stun after stun. And it just reminds me of those glory days where you just have those stun lock comps and um, they weren't much fun. But Vala and Li Ming, double assassin, very aggressive here. They're running these picks down to the wire, but they are not concerned about that support. No, not yet, indeed. I mean, it's all just, I guess, about the strategy. And as we sort of saw with just the bannings, they are, I think, also going a little bit for uh, comfort bans as well, or just bans that they don't really want to deal with. Like you said, although Thrall, Alaric, they're strong picks, even Falstad, I think it's just picks that they themselves as teams don't really want to verse. Same as on Warhead Junction, like what makes those champs all sort of excel? They can sort of lock down an area. Um and just sort of pick you off. So that's not really what you want to find on a map like this. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to actually read how teams draft because there's a lot of strategy behind it. And a lot of times you'll find that, you know, a team can actually win the game purely through draft alone. Um, you know, a team might be better mechanically or better in terms of macro strategy, but if their draft doesn't allow them to play professionally and to, you know, carry out the job, then they're going to struggle a fair bit here. And, you know, there are times when teams do ban from comfort and, and they ban out of preference and what they think is strong in here early, for instance. There's also times when there's a comp in mind and you've got to realize what negates what we're trying to achieve. And you can see that the Frawl, especially with that Sundering and Earthquake being so proficient, mm -hmm. paired with the Alarak, that really would give the blue side a bad day. Oh, yeah, especially that Valor and Li Ming showing. Even the Brightwing would have a hard day <laughs> sort of trying to pick off or just run away from all of that. But I really like the Jaina and Malfurion picks because they've also now got a mage and they've also got a really strong a high tier support so they've got a very real rounded team now so if i was blue team now i'm not really sure what i'd go for whether i go for you know another sort of bruiser or if we want more i guess damage i guess they're gonna need a bruiser just judging by that they but do. then you've got tychus looking down at you so you're like maybe we don't want one so oh they're yeah, in an interesting one. spot right now. I mean, you, yeah. you're looking at the side of um, and Red Team, and they've got so many ways of trying to zone you out from an objective. They've got the Jaina, they've got the Malfurion, Zaya, paired with the ETC, which can just jump amongst absolutely anything. It's so damn frustrating right now for them. And I mean, these picks are drumming down to the very last second. What have they defaulted to? We're going to find out. It's Chen. Good old Chen. He can fill a bruise roll, he can fill a tank roll, but also he can spin to win as soon as he pops that barrel form. He's got a lot of uh, potential to really, um, you know, position for his team and set up kills. Mm, exactly right. And, I mean, even if he, I mean, God forbid, takes the other royalty, he can even use the little panda bros to, as I like calling him, to sort of zone. So, actually, I kind of like the Chen pick. I think it might even work for them, Skimmy. So, we haven't seen him in a while, but it doesn't mean he's down and out. I don't think they're going to go for Panda Pals. It seems to me like this is a barrel pick where they're wanting to try and split up this team because, like I said, they've got so much AoE control, so many mm. ways of trying to synergize with each other. Uh, oh, you it know, would ruin them. On top of entangling roots. I think Panda Pals would, uh, you know, almost be destroyed as quickly as that as well. So 
It's looking to me like this is going to be a barrel pick, but we're going to load up into things here. Game number one on Warhead Junction. Left side, it is the blue team. It's the Shadow playing Brightwing. Old Tibian playing Vala. Single Della is on Li Ming. Maya, well, he's Maya, but he's playing Chen. And Session, he's rounding things out for Sasu, and he's playing Muradin. And then on the red team, which uh, actually, if you know the team name, just pass it on, Skimmy. But we've got Omar playing ETC Gulua on Malfurion. Sorry if I said that wrong. Hagalatin on Tychus, Nathan on Jaina, and Matt Press on Zarya. That's initial D Mega Mix. What an interesting name to go about. And I'm not sure how we're going to be able to say that in the heat of battle, but we'll call that the initial. The initial. initial. Done. Nice and easy for you. But here you go, guys. Warhead Junction taking all the beauty of that mini map. One big map it is indeed. And we're going to have to see how these teams decide to collaborate on this map. The most hated one of them all. Would you say it's hated more than Haunted Mines? I like Haunted Mines, so don't ask me that. I actually was very sad when they got rid the of that. Then. <laughs> <laughs> My most hated map would probably be Five, Cursed Hollows, but that four, gets a lot of competitive three, players. Three, see, I'm not doing something wrong. One. Maybe. What about Garden of Terror? That's my personal pet peeve. Oof. Yeah, no, not a big fan, but my highest win rate, so interesting. So that's how the cookie crumbles, eh? Here we go, yep. straight off with the uh, 1v5, it seems. Matt Breas, he is a tank, but he's trying to tank on the world right now. It's a contest for the watch point. You know it always means so much to these teams. And it doesn't matter if people will die for it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You've got to lock in that all-important level 1 vision point so you can see all. Oh, look at this. Nathan just collapsed upon. He's stepped a little bit too far forward. He's going to get taken out there for first blood, but the exchange goes on towards mine. No, he actually pops that drunken brawler. He is so damn elusive. And he manages to soak up a ton of damage and run away to live. Nathan just got popped right there, Skimmy, for lack of a better word. I was like, oh, he can do it. No, nope, he's gone. And that's just a ton of damage going out there. Just what they need to sort of watch out for. And <laughs> just being harassed right here by Session. Absolutely, the rotations are coming out. Looks like the entanglement roots might just be enough. He gets the self shield as well as the heal from that regrowth, but Sashin is jumping in with the stun. He's looking for more. He does actually get the kill. Now Sashin is the one on the retreat. Ultivian is there in support, looking to pop out some damage to, to basically prevent the chase. But damn, these rotations are really working well for them so far. Mm, they are indeed, and I mean, it might have been a little bit of overconfidence right there too, because a little bit of cheeky beast stepping went down before Matt Brest was like, uh oh, I'm actually in a bit of trouble now with uh, members of Sassu catching up. And that's, uh, I think that's common in a nutshell, really, isn't it? If you beast step, you have to pay the price, and that tax was met with a swift death. <laughs> swift death, indeed. Uh, I'm just having a look at the talents here, Skimmy. I mean, there's nothing much that I can see out, but I guess worth calling out is sort of Zarya's gone for the stacking quest to get as much energy as possible. So just making sure that every time she spends in lane, she's getting her energy globes and then so she can increase her overall max energy. So just kind yeah. of a long game here. A few different builds you can actually go for when you're playing Zarya, but I'm going to actually cut myself off there because there is damage going up in this mid lane right now. And both members on the red side of the initial are taken out. Actually, they drop down to a third of their life total. But it doesn't matter. Mr. Tychus, for lack of a better word, uh, actually gets the aggression on towards Vala, takes out his counterpart for the assassin. And this is a great time for the down a level, but right now the warheads are available. One in the middle, one, one in the top. It's going to be a 4v3 skirmish breaking out here, but it seems to be that initial. Well, they've got the poke, and they've got the ways of uh, capping this one. I mean, they're just sort of keeping him off at bay, but there we go, the cheeky sort of interrupt there. It's not going to be the worst to sort of let it go down, but the longer they sort of stall it asking me, it's going to kind of end in their favor. Potential. Well, you can see, yeah, Stingled is doing a fair chunk of poke. They've got great poke in, in terms of actually uh, denying this one. You've got both uh, Vala, Leeming, as well as the Brightwing and Session once again leading the front. He's gone for that breast once more. They've actually left the kill off Session and to jump across at the last second going team. Do you have this kill? They do secure it. They are still a four level up, and there are two warheads still on this map. See what it is going to begin that cap this time here, but it looks like Tychus is going to get caught out right now. He's taking so much from that stun, and Session has been on point. Mm, the whole time, so there we go. It was just a lot of that poke kind of coming through and just not giving them a bit of a respite. And then once they sort of saw the opportunity, they all sort of uh, just really pounced on that breast to just sort of fall, and even the shield was not enough to save him. So, I mean, touching back on my point from before, I mean, you're looking at the Zaya, there's uh, three common builds you can go for. You can go for the high energy build where you're just looking to try and uh, stay sustained, try and soak up as much attention as you can. Obviously, punch out damage as a result. You've got the grenade build where you're looking to be a side DPS, and you've also got the melee build when you're versing a very tanky opposition. 
once again, these rotation kills are coming across. They pick up Mouth this time, and they are looking to hit level 7, push in top lane, and pop some nukes. But Sashin jumping in for more. Maya is going to get amongst it. He's getting dropped down low. The nuke is coming on down. Maya actually might pay the price here, but not before he takes out Nathan. He's looking for a second kill now. He's gone on towards Tychus. He pays the price in the end. He does get taken out. Altivian is looking for things. He's got Bolt up now. This is Cure. Oh, no, actually, he denies himself. He thought that Leeming had it. He gets away, Vandy. Wow. I think he was trying to be like, oh, don't worry, you've got this one, don't worry about it. And Altivian was just kind of like, it's all on you now. And Singela was like, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is awkward for us now. That's very, literally when your trust is being betrayed. You get, yeah. You get the this game now. I can see it happening. You watch. Oh, I mean, he might be a bit tilted after that. We'll have to see how the game sort of goes on. Um, nothing to be worried about. He'll just know Altivian will be like, all right, now. That was, that was the only chance. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to go for every kill now, right now, even if it means I die. Basically, yes. Well, here comes the invade right now. It's Matt Press once again. It seemed to be a bit of a focus on this guy. He makes no even attempt to run away. Just stands there going, look, my uh, fate has been sealed. I'm dead. Have my camp. See what I care. <laughs> See what I care. I mean, it's just more like, yep, the end is coming. Just got to let it go. And it looks like there's going to be a bit of a huge push down here with four members of uh, Sassy down there. Yeah, but the attention in the top lane is focused definitely onto Shadow. He's not able to get away. He does have that uh, face shift available, but it's just not going to be enough. Stuns, DPS, do connect. Two members take him out for free. Argleton is in the mid lane. They're going to get that attention on that uh, vision once more. And they have the Mule Vandy. They're going to try and turtle this one up. They realize they are behind a level and a half right now. It's nearly level 10 for Sasu. They are finding a huge lead with this push in bot lane. The nukes came across. Yeah, Merc Camp has gone through too. Both those towers leading towards that Keeper out of ammo right now. And they are looking to try and make something of this. They do, but they just want to watch out because they don't have that all-important level 10 yet. I mean, they're getting close and that'll secure it. So right there, that poor Tychus, that's what secured it. Now they really got to watch out because once they there's really a bit of a big ball happening now. Yeah, and look at this. Ultimates across the board. We've got the Blink Kill instead of the Emerald Wind. We've got Rain of Vengeance looking for more lockdown. Disintegrate comes across too. And actually, Panda Pals has been picked up. Storm, Earth, and Fire. There goes the Rain of Vengeance. There's Session 2. Actually, it's uh, Session who drops down in the first extent there, but it's a trade. One tank for one tank. They're going to back away right now. They have the structural advantage. They still don't have 10, despite this. They're still actually chasing on. Can't imagine they'll do it for much longer. Red Team do need to catch up here, but for Sasu, They've got to respond, they've got that camp still pushing in the top lane. It's perfect timing because two warheads have just spawned up there. That is good timing indeed, and I mean, they're just going to want to try capture as much as possible to keep the lead going on. But in saying that, the initial can still ca uh, catch up, they're not far behind. And it's good that they're taking all of their siege objectives when they can to kind of put that added pressure on the map. Like you said, it was a moment, a matter a sort of time before Sassy had to go back up top to deal with it. So it gave him a bit of a respite almost. I like this from the Shadow, he's actually sat in the bot lane, picked up that nuke, he's going to now phase shift into the top lane, that's where the skirmish is breaking out over these top two ones. Now Singada is going to do as much as he can, takes a few hits on that blizzard, but does manage to jump away for the final two, and it's going to be a case of fighting over this final one. Session jumping so far into Africa, but he finalizes that kill. They're looking for Omar right now, who's taken a fair chunk, he's down to 500, stun connects on towards Malfury, and it's look I mean, it's literally Mirrodin against the world right now. He's up against two. He's got Ultivian finally in support, and Ultivian having a bit of a deja vu moment, thinking when that Leeming should have died. How about I pick up a Jaina instead? He's going to go for the kill this time. They're taking out two in this exchange. They do pick up the nuke at the same time. Omar, meanwhile, the entire time was actually respawning, uh, sorry, herfing in that top. And they are going to sacrifice this one. They are 10 finally, and he has gone for the stage dive. Well, we've got three nukes now, Skimmy, on Sasu's side. Now, that's going to be a lot of firepower that they're packing here. So surely, surely the initial's going to be looking to try and secure this all-important last one, especially now that they've got the heroic ultimates. Heroic ultimates are both online. Two level lead. There goes the expulsion zone nice and early. Not really going to achieve too much with this one. Face shift is going to come across as well. Top up the rest of the team. Keep Sasu nice and healthy. We have every ultimate across the board. Instead of that expulsion zone, it's going to be Omar who goes amongst it straight away, but he gets taken out with the Rain of Vengeance. There goes Storm Earth and Fire connects with the uh, Ring of Frost, but the Rain of Vengeance hits another. And that takes out two easy members, two easy kills. Both tanks gone, the supports and the assassins left to really mop up the damage. They're stuck at that tower. Can't really achieve too much. That mule was a consolation prize, if anything. 
<laughs> consolation prize. But I mean, I guess what really was strange right there was that uh, Omar, the ETC, was sort of playing as though he had selected Mosh Pit. He sort of slid into all of them, but I had seen that he had taken um, Save Dive, but in saying that, maybe he should have backed off and then tried to re engage with that because he didn't really achieve much running like that. Nathan, oh, oh my he's god! He's going to come in for double off. trouble and he's going to look for the kill, but it does not matter. Twilight Dream comes across, but it doesn't matter. He's going to get taken out, make that a triple kill, and this is where Lee Ming really gets rolling. The nukes are flying down fast and thick. Session finding another stun. Shadow coming across looking for more lockdown. Polymorph connects. Matt Breast once again looking to try and do as much damage from afar. That is another kill, but it's a trade actually because the nuke does get dropped. Muradin has been taken out in this one, but they are looking to try and go for the core now. Vandy, they've got a nuke that they're trying to cap, but they just cannot. They have no time to do this. Respawns are coming across now fast, and they are trying to back away as quickly as they can. Has gone for the, uh, the Frostbolt build, Jaina. Locking down on Tibian for as long as she may. And she might actually get picked up here if she's gone for the power slide. Well, she's gone for the vault, and the power slide does uh, not actually hit in this case. Chasing on, this is your typical quick match game right here. Oh, it's just so <laughs> hard watching it. You're just like, oh, come on, with the cooldowns. But unfortunately, there's not really much lockdown, so Altivian just sort of strolls around, almost skipping hand in hand with ETC chasing after them. But no one's remembered to pick up that nuke in sort of their haste to try and get blood. They've all forgotten about <laughs> their poor little nuke, but you know what, Skimmy, it's safe. It's right next to the core. The core will look after it. It's being babysat by, uh, or babysat by the core, you know? It's like a case of, uh, if you die next, that's your responsibility to pick that up. And it looks like Jen is going to be one that might have to actually pick that one up, because she, she gets taken out so, so quickly. The Ring of Frost does absolutely nothing. Expulsion Zone finds no uh, benefit either. Three members drop away. They're looking for Matt Brace right now. He is so damn slow. He cannot find any way to get out of this. That is four members down. Disintegrate is looking to pick up the fifth, but Omar gets away on 250. And this is a complete hammering right now. Sasu three levels up, a keep in hand, and team fights just being smashed upon. It's really unfortunate to see this, Gimme. I mean, Nathan seems to just get picked off before he can do anything. Even though his Ring of Frost is kind of going down, it's not really getting much value because he's not getting, I guess, an ideal condition to sort of set up. And with him sort of taking up, it's like, who's all their damage gone? So, it sort of shows, I guess, the lane pressure, the bullying, and even the map control that Sasu's kind of got over the initial currently in this game. Yeah, it's all the uh, all of the above, as they say, when you're comparing these points. They pick up a boss for their efforts. Next, Warheads are spawning two in three seconds. And they have all the map control on this side to actually secure both of them. Session is going to jump in once again. The Entangling Roots preemptively drop to try and block off that path. But he's just looking to be aggressive. He has the confidence. He has the support. He has the level advantage. They're going to nearly hit 16 before 13 has even been acquired. It's into a bit of a ridiculous state right now, but two nukes are being picked up. They're going to escort this boss in, and you can only imagine where they're headed now. Oh, uh, it's headed for trouble, Skinny, essentially. And is this a bit of a defensive nuke kind of going to try lower down the boss? It looks like. I mean, I'm not sure how much value they're going to find as a result of this one. Stage though comes in, going for the back line straight away. Ring of Frost the once again does not find any value because the nukes are dropping down. They're on the course, down to 10%. Twilight Dream followed by the Expulsions on the court. He's dropping down the boss itself. He's going to find this one because the fight broke out. The GG Parachute flies across the map. And, I mean, that was a game of uh, not even two halves. It was a game of uh, easiness. I don't know how to best describe it. It was, it was done and said before it was even over. <laughs> <laughs> I think a little bit of that. I mean, I gather what um, some of the chat was saying. I think Matt Breast might have been having a little bit of issue with his computer there. But in saying that, oh. He was like top he damage, though. Exactly. Yeah, he was top damage. And I mean, look at that. that. You could say, look, team, I'm lagging, but I'm still better than all of you. So uh, there's some <laughs> pride. There's some pride in knowing that. Not so much that. It's more just, I guess, Sassy was just doing such a good job of just bullying and picking sort of every available opportunity they got to sort of cause havoc. And as well as just getting those all-important nukes every time they were taking down fortifications, just increasing their lead skinny. And then finally with that boss, like, what could you really do? Two nukes and a boss? Whew. It's what I'm really good. curious about this build from our Fury knows he's gone for Mule at seven. Now I can understand to a certain degree Mule has a benefit. Okay, like if you're behind, sure, but the comp they were versing had so much CC that cleanse is surely the most definitive option there. And mm. I feel as if that could have um, really have thrown the tides where you see, say, Nathan get blown up in a matter of seconds. Yeah, and then just sort of cleanse and help him out and try to get the heal on him. As you said, exactly that. As and as well as. It's a bit of a strange one because this is Warhead Junction. You're going to heal that structure right back up and it's going to get nuked and it's just a matter of time. So like you said, perhaps cleanse would have been a smarter option there. 
Well, let's jump to the crux of things. We got the MVP from this game. Now, my money has to be on the man that led the front line. It was Muradon. I believe Session played that one to a T. Stuns were connecting. He had all the pressure in the world to keep that team back, and he was finding those kills. I would have said single because of uh, his KDA and the way he's done that damage. But that one time that uh, he let down Ottivian, that for me swung the balance. I mean, I was going to say, let's give it to Mia for picking Panda Pals and verifying me, but just kidding with you. Definitely agree with you <laughs> on all points about Sashin's Muradin. So let's award him the MVP. Well, there you go, Session. Congratulations, mate. Round number one of week two of the Games to Qualifiers does go in favor of yourself. Gets the chance then to win. From our lovely sponsors at Plantronics, a headset made by them. Let's pass you back to your host. It's Kit Fox to round things out. Thank you very much, Skimmy and Vandy, for that amazing match there on Braxis Holdout. Oh, sorry, Warhead Junction, rather. Uh, Sasu coming up tops over Initial D there. And congratulations to Sashin for getting himself the MVP nomination. He now goes into the draw to win himself a Plantronics headset the official headset sponsor of GameStar. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We're just going to wait for a couple more results to roll in. We're going to wait for Meme Team and Ethereal Cat. We'll be back very, very soon for some more. Here is the Storm action right after this.